At the time of writing this, Canada, a country often known for maple syrup, the world's classiest tuxedo, and whatever the hell this is, has invoked the Emergency Measures Act for the first time in its history. An occupying force of trucks, anti-mandate, and other COVID safety protocol protesters, and people who generally hate Justin Trudeau, have descended upon multiple Canadian cities. Paralyzing the local residents and businesses and shutting down major trade borders with the United States across the country. In the fog of all this, much of the international coverage of the event has been confused, to say the very least. Fox News has hailed them as working class heroes, with Tucker Carlson making it his cause célèbre, and prominent conservative politicians like Ted Cruz, Ron DeSantis, and even Donald Trump have all offered their praise. We want those great Canadian truckers to know that. We are with them all the way. They are. They've really shown something. Liberal media and Trudeau himself were quick to label the entirety of the protest as white supremacists or anti-science, pointing to the presence of far-right imagery such as Confederate flags or worse by some of the attendees. The failure on both parts to identify how the organizers of the rally themselves do have direct ties to the far-right in Canada, but also how they managed to galvanize a growing anger present in the country feeling helpless at the hands of the liberal elite, shows a glaring problem with the way both sides are presenting the story. To help explain, we've teamed up with Robert Evans' podcast, It Could Happen Here, whose co-host Garrison Davis did an incredible job analyzing and tracking the origins of how we found ourselves here today. If you'd like to listen to the two-part series and subscribe to their podcast, and you really do, please check out the links below in the description. Canada is often seen as an escape from the more divisive, violent, and fascist elements of U.S. politics and culture. But just like climate change, capitalism, or any other enveloping force, fascism and the slide towards it can never be truly escaped, right? There is no other, there is no a way, and it's especially hard to see it when it's growing on the back of your own head. Their corporate communists are stealing money. It, I mean, this is literally theft by deception. Primarily through Islamophobia, far-right ethno-nationalist tendencies have been bubbling under the surface of Canada for a long while. And since Trudeau has taken office in 2015, there has been a perfect politically allowed boogeyman to blame every problem onto. That can include everything from Trudeau is taking away our oil and gas jobs, or Trudeau is bringing in Muslim terrorists to Canada, or Trudeau is starving your children through health mandates. Canadian right-wing protest has been steadily growing the past five years. There's been multiple flare-ups of far-right rhetoric with the Canadian Yellow Vests, the Western Separatist uh, Wexit or Western Exit Movement, and the pseudo-fascist People's Party of Canada. Incorporation of pandemic conspiracies and anti-vaccine sentiments into the already disaffected rural Canadian right-wingers starting in 2020 and continuing to the present has accelerated not only the conspiratorial far-right rhetoric among conservative voters, but also what is seen as valid political action in those people's eyes. But before we get into how the convoy started, with anger concerning COVID-19 health mandates and misinformation concerning empty store shelves, we have to first go back in time to even before the COVID-19 virus was a blip on anyone's radar. In February 2019, the Canadian Yellow Vests organized something called the United We Roll Convoy. The result was around 170 trucks driving cross-country through the more liberal east to Ottawa. The goal was to represent the concerns of disenfranchised oil and gas workers in the western provinces and their opposition to proposed environmental and new energy policies. Yellow Vests Canada was largely founded by individuals already associated with Canada's far right, which at the time was primarily united through anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia. Inspired by the French Yellow Vest movement, they copied their aesthetics and adopted new grievances and reactionary rhetoric that would get them a much larger audience. By the time United We Roll arrived in Ottawa, the media had started to catch on to the more problematic elements about their organization. Neo-Nazi Faith Goldie spoke on a stage, Many members of hate groups responded in attendance, and with the numbers so low, it made their more extreme participants stick out. Instead of focusing the message on oil and gas, as they claimed to represent Western alienation from a distant liberal Ottawa, 
Some of its participants seemed more interested in protesting Ottawa's immigration policies than arguing for specific fixes for Alberta's oil patch. Plus, if you peeked inside any Canadian Yellow Vest Facebook group, you would be flooded with hundreds of examples of explicit anti-Muslim racism and calls for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's arrest and execution, a theme that remains common among COVID conspiracy demonstrations today. But at the end of it, United We Roll was widely considered a bust, with only a few hundred participants in Ottawa, and despite raising almost $150,000, the organizers failed to disclose how much of that money was actually spent on convoy expenses like gas and food. Afterwards, the Yellow Vests Canada movement started to kind of die out, though some holdouts kept smaller demonstrations going for months, particularly in the conservative oil province of Alberta. But to us now, United We Rule can be seen as a small test run for the current situation in 2022. In fact, it shares many of the same organizers and even the same promotional materials. Except this time, they have the added weight of many more people radicalized into conspiracism throughout the pandemic and much more funding. So with that in mind, let's dive into the components of the initial organizing effort. On January 14th, 2022, a GoFundMe account was set up for a so-called trucker convoy, ahead of the January 15th adoption of the mandate requiring all cross-border transportation drivers to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Vaccine mandates in Canada have been in effect since October 30th for ship crews, railways, and airline workers. But effective January 15th, the federal government expanded the requirement to truck drivers returning from the states, and those who remain unvaccinated will not be able to enter Canada without quarantine. One week later, a reciprocal policy went into effect in the United States for Canadian truckers crossing into their border, which means going forward, you cannot really cross the border at all while remaining unvaccinated. At this point in mid-January, a majority of Canadians still broadly supported health mandates aimed at limiting the spread of COVID. But a big part of the early propaganda push for the convoy was photos alleged to have been from current Canadian grocery stores, which they were not, with barren, empty shelves. The idea was that COVID restrictions were already severely impacting the supply line, and any additional mandates would begin to starve the population and effectively shut down international trade. Put a note in this idea, by the way, it will come up later. Ideas for another truck convoy like United We Roll have been tossed around for a while online. And with this new mandate on truckers and vaccines, a time presented itself to give the convoy idea another go. In the early truck convoy organizing, there were primarily four familiar far-right faces working together to set things up, none of whom are truck drivers, by the way. The originally listed organizers on the GoFundMe page were Tamara Litch and BJ Ditcher. Both have notable experience with far-right organizing. Tamara Litch was born in my home province of Saskatchewan, but now hails from the town of Medicine Hat, Alberta, where she served as an organizer for Yellow Vests Canada, a regional coordinator for the Separatist Western Exit, or Wexit, movement in Alberta, and now the secretary for the Maverick Party, another far-right extreme separatist movement and fringe political party. Litch started attending and boosting Yellow Vest events starting in 2018, and her social media posts from around the time show in one moment calling out some hateful rhetoric from within the movement, while also posting Islamophobic articles of her own and conspiracies about the Muslim Brotherhood operating in Canada. A few days after the GoFundMe was created, Benjamin B.J. Ditcher, one-time Conservative Party of Canada candidate, People's Party of Canada booster, and co-founder of a Canadian far-right podcast network, appeared as a co-organizer on the GoFundMe page. 2019, he claimed that Islamist entryism is rotting away our society like syphilis. Benjamin Ditcher was also one of the first people to give a speech at the first proto-fascist People's Party of Canada conference in Quebec, saying that the Conservative Party of Canada is suffering from the stench of cultural relativism and political Islam, and a whole bunch of stuff, you know, in that general vein. It is suffering from the stench of extremism, the same way third world countries suffer from extremist groups, separatist groups, communist guerrilla factions, paramilitaries, organized crime, and more. James Botter was another one of the four key organizers of the trucker convoy to Ottawa. Botter is an admitted conspiracy theorist who has endorsed QAnon and called COVID the biggest political scam in history. 
He's also a former activist with the Yellow Vests Canada and United We Roll. Broder's main project, however, is running the Canada Unity website, which is one of the original nexus points for organizing and spreading word about this convoy. The group contends that vaccine mandates and passports are illegal under Canada's constitution, the Nuremberg Code, and a host of other international conventions. Botter has long been a fringe figure, but his movements started picking up steam and support as announcements and continuations of restrictions aimed at curbing COVID-19 spread have continued. The last big major player is Patrick King, another former Yellow Vester, one-time major figure in the Wexit movement, as well as United We Roll. On January 18th, 2022, Pat King hosted a live stream for James Botter to promote the Canada Unity website and to announce it as the official page for the Freedom Trucker Convoy, or as they called it, Operation Bear Hug. King is a conspiracy theorist and popular streamer that attracts an audience farther right than Canada's usual conservatives. King's made headlines for drumming up fear and then following through with his supporters with violence at rallies put on by BLM and Antifa. Now what it is, is it's the part of the depopulation. And a lot of people don't understand what that means and what there is, is there's an end game. It's called depopulation of the Caucasian race, or the Anglo-Saxon. And that's what the goal is, is to depopulate the Anglo-Saxon race. Because they are the ones with the strongest bloodlines. So the less procreation, the less white people, or, you know, Anglo-Saxon. Let's say Anglo-Saxon, because when I say white, all, all the Antifa guys call up the race card. So we're going to call ourselves Anglo-Saxon. In a 2019 stream about the then upcoming federal election, King complained that he had to leave the movement due to their lack of success, saying, quote, the election won't matter unless you want to change your national language to Chinese or Mandarin or Hebrew. He then went on to compare Chinese names to the sound of change falling downstairs. Unless you want to change your national language to Chinese or Mandarin or Hebrew. You might want to change your uh, your name to Ishmael or drop a bunch of change down the stairs and call yourself Chong Ching Ching Chang. <laughs> he has publicly distorted facts about the Holocaust, a form of Holocaust denial, saying, I do know that the Holocaust was reduced to 1.5 million and not the 6 million that it was said to be. He then invoked the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that Jewish people are secretly in control of world governance, media, and finances, saying, quote, The questions that have been asked several times to the ADL and to the Jewish government and communities. We have Jewish world bankers who are dictating our government policies and controlling our politicians, unquote. So yeah, considering King's history of saying blatantly fascist things, some organizers and convoy supporters tried to distance King from the Freedom Convoy movement to not damage the initial fundraising effort. The controversy around King resulted in a statement being released onto the fundraising page saying, King is not and has never been affiliated with our movement, nor has he been a part of our great team of volunteers. The update uh, was afterwards deleted, and then King claimed in a video that the statement was a public relations move because he was being attacked online. For a while, King was still listed as the Northern Alberta contact for the western portion of the convoy. So those are the four people that laid the organizing groundwork that spawned this entire thing and put it into motion. But what made this convoy different from United We Roll 1.0 is the almost two years of COVID isolation, which has given ample time for groups like the Yellow Vests and extreme far-right groups to completely fold into the rapidly growing anti-vax and COVID conspiracy movement in Canada. And along with that, using people's seething hatred of Justin Trudeau to radicalize thousands and thousands of people online to getting them more comfortable with the idea of participating in political protest. It's really important to mention that the protests are not organized by Canadian trucking unions or really Canadian truckers. The largest trucking unions have come out against the protests, and they do not appear to reflect the values of most Canadians or most Canadian truckers. More than 80% of the Canadian public is vaccinated, including almost 90% of truckers, according to Canada's Minister of Transport. 
The Canadian Trucking Alliance issued a statement saying it does not support and strongly disapproves of any protests on public roads, highways, or bridges. According to the Canadian Trucking Alliance, the mandate could impact around 12 to 16,000 Canadian commercial drivers, which is just about 10 to 15 percent of the industry's cross-border drivers. During the pandemic, repeated polls have shown that a majority of Canadians support public health measures to contain the pandemic, but the number of Canadians who would like to see restrictions end has risen in recent weeks. With Omicron cases on the decline, some provinces are starting to remove restrictions and requirements. The public sentiment appears to be moving in the direction of opening up communities. Throughout the last two weeks of January, the number of Canadians saying that they would like to see restrictions end has risen by 15 percentage points, to a majority of 54%. Demonstrations have found a way to tap into pandemic fatigue among conservatives across the country after months of lockdown. More than two-thirds of Canadians have said they have very little in common with how the Ottawa protesters see things, but 32% say that they have a lot in common, according to a recent survey conducted by a Canadian research firm. Unlike 2019's United We Roll, the Freedom Convoy Against Health Mandates was able to successfully capitalize on Western feelings of neglect and isolation from the ruling liberal elite in the East and in the capital of Ottawa. The right ingredients at the right time flung the trucker Freedom Convoy into the conservative zeitgeist. The original GoFundMe page set up on January 14th to financially support convoy participants was able to raise $10 million in just under three weeks. The difference in initial law enforcement reaction to the protest convoy, made up of largely, you know, conservative, middle-class white Canadians, compared to other protests like, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests or, say, the RCMP's typical response to First Nations protests. I was big enough to stand and um, they had asked me to move and I said, no, I'm not moving. I'm here to support Bitsuitan and I'm not moving. Um, and so they said, well, we can arrest you. I said, yeah. And I'm proud to have been arrested. Breaking down the door. Get out here. Breaking down the door. Hey, show me your hands. Show me hands. Get that gun off me. Get your gun off me. Lower your gun. And blockades defending their land. The comparisons cannot be overanalyzed. You know, the latter two forms of protest I mentioned actually do challenge societal power structures that prop up white Canada, while as this convoy protest does not, and instead plays into those very power structures. That dynamic played a major role in how the police handled, or didn't handle, the first few days of the protest, in which, during those early days, the convoy attendees were free to build infrastructure that resulted in the protest escalating into a full-scale occupation. The official line from original convoy organizers, uh, minus Pat King of course, however, has tried to remain focused. In a Facebook Live broadcast, James Botter of Canada Unity instructed his supporters to stop talking about the vaccine and instead stick to messages of freedom. The goal of adopting a more restricted and relatable protest cause is to hopefully drum up more widespread support and validity. And it initially worked in some ways and not in others. Numerous members of the Conservative Party have come out to meet protesters, especially throughout the first few days. There's always going to be a small number of unsavory characters. That doesn't matter what the protest is, what the cause is. But what I see today uh, are, everywhere I go, are just everyday Canadians who are peacefully uh, assembling and uh, expressing their point of view. Now former Conservative Party leader Aaron O'Toole met with convoy participants, albeit away from the main protest site. Both People's Party of Canada leader Maxine Bernier and Ontario Member of Provincial Parliament and leader of the de facto Ontario arm of the PPC, Randy Healer, who has made many recent anti-Semitic comments, both gave speeches on Saturday the 29th in front of the Parliament building. The current Memorandum of Understanding, posted on the Canada Unity website, which collected over 30,000 signatures, served as a sort of bargaining pitch between the convoy and the Canadian government. The Memorandum of Understanding, or the MOU, calls on Canada's appointed senators and Canada's Governor General, the representative of Queen Elizabeth II in Canada's constitutional monarchy, to abolish all COVID-19 related restrictions and to allow all unvaccinated workers whose employment was terminated because of vaccine mandates to get their jobs back. 
James Botter, the guy who runs Canada Unity, insisted to his followers that the MOU would force the government's hand and possibly even trigger fresh elections, if enough people signed. The more controversial Pat King laid out an alternative, however, a more direct plan of action to the occupiers. In a January Facebook livestream, King said that, What we want to focus on is our politicians, their houses, their locations. If political pressure doesn't work, blocking major supply chains will be later on. It's having a major impact on America's supply chain already. Uh, truckers with the Freedom Convoy shutting down a third border crossing. They are now impacting travel into Michigan, North Dakota, and Montana. The Biden administration calling on the Canadian government to step in and end all this. The trucker protest or Freedom Convoy or eventually the trucker occupation or the honking never had the 50,000 trucks that Joe Rogan may have suggested but it did find a way to gain more leverage over the government, shutting down trade with the United States. Negotiations in Coots, Alberta were slow, and like in other cases, it seemed like the police were unwilling to take action. Eventually, they would seize the Ambassador Bridge, connecting Ontario to Windsor, Detroit, severing the largest trade crossing to the United States. While the initial protests and even the early stages of the occupation may not have threatened existing power structures, it was now costing the Canadian economy millions of dollars a day. Numerous auto manufacturing plants had to close down and thousands of workers were stuck at home without pay. It wasn't long before Justin Trudeau decided to take drastic measures. Now, the Emergency Measures Act does have some important checks and balances in place. It replaced the War Measures Act in 1988, which gave the government much more sweeping power. It is only invoked for a period of 30 days through a parliamentary vote and can be rescinded earlier at any time by parliament again. However, the Liberal government did use it to make permanent changes to the way companies must report to FinTrack, that's the Financial Transaction and Report Analysis Centre of Canada. Required in the measure is that any banking institution, insurance company, credit union, trust and loan company, payment processor, and online fundraising platform must determine on a continuing basis if they are in possession or property tied to individuals or entities involved in illegal assemblies. It also gave the power to financial institutions to freeze accounts or assets deemed to be related to illegal activity without a court order or due process. And because the Emergency Measures Act requires there to be a national emergency that seriously endangers the lives and safety of Canadians and is of such proportion or nature as to exceed the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it or seriously threatens the ability of the government of Canada to preserve the sovereignty, security and territorial integrity of Canada. <sighs> The Canadian Civil Liberties Association has not only come out in opposition of its use, but is now suing the federal government for invoking it. This isn't to downplay the severity of what happened. For weeks on end, citizens who lived in the Ottawa City core were subjected to non-stop noise pollution from morning until night, and inhaled the diesel fumes from trucks constantly running. Numerous people were attacked on the street either for wearing masks or telling occupiers to stop. Hate crimes occurred in businesses. A soup kitchen had to close after staff were accosted and truckers demanded to be served food intended for the homeless. Women's shelters, retirement homes, and people living with disabilities spoke about being terrified. This is not right. And my biggest fear is the repercussions from all this. Once this is all over, once they all leave, how are these people going to recover from this? They're not good. They don't feel safe in their own community. There were reports of people testing handcuffs on the front of apartment buildings to see if the doors could be opened from the inside after being locked. Someone was filmed setting off fireworks in an older building and then taping the doors to the outside shut. Thirteen people were eventually arrested, several of whom were charged with plotting to murder several police officers. Amongst their arsenal were bulletproof vests with insignias of far-right militias, who had direct ties to another key organizer, Jeremy McKenzie. Yet the border crossing was eventually cleared due to a court injunction and enforcement, not by the Emergency Measures Act. And the private accounts of numerous convoy organizers were frozen due to a judge's decision that came at the hands of a lawsuit by a concerned Ottawa citizen who went after the finances of the organizers. I'm trying to be a voice for everyone. I kind of intentionally put a target on my back, but really I am more than happy to do so if it means that I can make a difference for the community. In fact, people counter-protesting across the country had success at not only pushing back against the convoy, but in some cases preventing it. Cyclists in Vancouver, for example, blocked the initial vans and campers that were coming into the city through a major street jamming their efforts to set up. And counter-protesters in Winnipeg pushed back against members trying to accomplish there what they had been doing in Ottawa. 
surprisingly leading to the police making their first arrest in the city, that being of an indigenous counter-protester with a sign that read, You weren't stolen land. None of the demands of the protesters or organizers directly spoke to the issues concerning truck drivers in the country, which is understandable considering how few of them actually were truckers. Problems like the disintegration of unions in the 1980s, wage theft being rampant, long overtime hours often with several health risks, and extended medical benefits were not brought up once. One in five truckers in Canada are South Asian, and they stated that their voices and concerns were not represented. In fact, many ended up stranded on the other side of the border once the occupiers shut it down, unable to get home. Canada Border Patrol, even the US Canada Patrol, they told us, like, don't even like talk to us, you can't even record us, nobody's like hearing for us. We are a lot of truckers, they don't even have food. Some of them have like the medical issues, some of them have like asthma, some of them have like thyroid issues, but no one is listening to us. Popular shows like Jimmy Dore, which claimed to represent workers, failed to identify any of this, or the far-right origins of the rally, and instead turned on unions in Canada when they dared to speak out against it. And so here, the Teamsters Union denounces the ongoing Freedom Convoy protest at the Canadian border that continues to hurt workers and negatively impact our economy. So what do you make of that when the Teamsters turn against workers who are actually doing the first time in my lifetime that workers in, my, in en masse are making a big dent into the oligarchy and, that, and then a union like the Teamsters seems to take the knees right from underneath. What do you say to that? A general strike doesn't seek to simply damage capital for the demands of a nebulous term like freedom. Workers band together to form a union and strike to gain bargaining power with their employers and leverage their lost surplus value as a bargaining chip. Not to mention the majority of the funding for the convoy came from outside of the country. No, liberals, it wasn't Russia, Jesus. After releasing a million dollars of its fundraiser to Tamara Lynch and BJ Ditcher, GoFundMe froze the account and sponsors had to turn to the Christian fundraising site Give, Send, Go. It would eventually be hacked, revealing the majority of the money came from outside of the country, and huge donations of thousands of dollars were coming in from wealthy business owners. You know, the capitalist class. Others speculated what if the left wanted to try these tactics? Should they be outright condemned in that instance, even if you disagreed with the people doing it? The thing is, they have and do. In Ferry Creek, where the occupation in protesting old growth deforestation, in defiance of corporate interests, police have arrested over 800 people already, and in some brutal footage, ripped off protesters' masks to spray them in the face. In Toronto, when homeless encampments were seen as a nuisance, both to wealthier locals and the real estate industry, they were met with aggressive force. And let us not forget the Wet'suwet'en people, who have been fighting with the RCMP to prevent the coastal gas link pipeline from going through their sovereign land and poisoning their water supply. In a single day, over 40 RCMP officers arrived in full tactical gear, with dogs and snipers to arrest elders and journalists, despite them being peaceful in their resistance. A running theme is the corporate interest behind each crackdown. The RCMP Pension Fund has investments in the Coastal GasLink Pipeline project if the power dynamics weren't striking enough. When the Freedom Convoy started threatening capital in the country, no longer could it be ignored. Justin Trudeau has repeatedly showed he doesn't care about the interests of workers or indigenous communities by continuing to sue residential school survivors in court and refusing to even implement a modest 1% tax on the richest Canadians in order to pay for crucially needed support systems under a pandemic. Doesn't do anything to show that you're interested in representing the concerns of all the citizens. It just validates the dismissal of you as being another out-of-touch liberal who doesn't care. Public opinion of the convoy continued to descend as it evolved into an occupation, to the point where the majority of Canadians actually approved of the use of the Emergency Measures Act for the first time. Numerous fringe figures became household names, with Pat King now experiencing 20,000 live viewers on Facebook and dozens of other far-right social media accounts blowing up in both their size and profitability. The Conservative Party danced on the edge of endorsement while on the cusp of a new leadership race, that's already signaling it will be moving towards a more populist message. While police seem to treat the people who shut down the border at coots like family, the eventual crackdown in Ottawa enraged conservatives globally, perhaps their first time witnessing police violence upholding state power. Facebook once again played a major role in the proliferation and popularization of far-right extremism in the country to absolutely no consequence. 
Ironically, the entire event would create the very supply shortages that the organizers falsified to fearmonger people into supporting anti-vaccine mandates and the convoy in the first place. Did workers gain more power through the process? Or did the government and financial institutions, both of whom seek to maintain the current structure of power? Before the thrilling conclusion to the saga, we want to again thank Garrison and the whole It Could Happen Here podcast for their work. This video and channel would not be possible without the continued support of our patrons. As these topics aren't advertiser friendly, we depend on your continued support to make them possible. So if you are in a position to do so, please consider joining over at patreon.com slash the surfs. And even just sharing this video goes a long way. And also all the other stuff like thumbs ups and comments and hitting that bell icon, they can really make a difference. If you're new here, we usually take a much more comedic look at world events, but thought this story had already been made enough into a joke that it didn't need our blathering. That being said, let's conclude this saga the only way we know how. By doing a ridiculous montage. and Peyton L. Just, we beseech thee to smite down our enemies. To our monarch, Tom Spiker, we are but your humble court jesters here to amuse you. To our lords, Trevor R., we give thanks for this spit of land for us to eke out this meager existence. To our knights, Merid, Cheryl Alvarez, Ruby Kelly, Ellie Leslie, Alex P., Brandon, Words Greenwood, Nate, that one guy, Hagbird Celine, Matthew Scarborough, Stellar Vision, Ariane McCarthy, Daniel Sutton, Coulter Smith, Val 9000, Jenna Tall, Quiet185, Anna Loves Riley, Omni, Riley and Anna, Poodlehawk, The Tim Caucus, Multi Mondi, Trevor Yanis, Lemmy 101, Anthropophojack, Seren 42, Catherine, Radical Maniac, Ramon Acosta, Nkosin, Violent Orchard, Sophie Baby, Political Puppy, Andreas Chiringuito, Zach Christensen, Josh Mickelson, Todd Buckingham, and Todd Lajeunesse. We raise our flag in a veil, and we salute you, our friends. <laughs>